As we go back to study number two, study number one, we looked at who we are in Christ right now. And kind of starting from the known, that's what, to, as a believer, is familiar to us, who we are in Christ. We are redeemed, we are saved, and all those different things that we listed. But then we, we've jumped back in study number two to say, who were we created to be? Now, that's not who we are now. In fact, we will never fully be who we were created to be until we are divested of our sin nature. And we are living, the closest thing is going to be in the millennial kingdom, then, of course, fully in heaven to come. But by the millennial kingdom, we will no longer have a sin nature. Only those that survived the tribulation, trusted Christ, and entered in their natural bodies in the millennium, only they will have an old nature in the sense that their children will be born and need to be saved during that time. But all the others who have died in Christ, they will have already have their their old natures taken away and we don't have that battle with sin anymore. But who God created us to be shows his design, his purpose, and the function for which we were created. And we understand here in the lesson we looked at, first of all, we are a creature. We didn't evolve. We're not an accident. We were created, and we were created by design. Does that help? All right. <clears throat> we were created by design. It says, when it says, I am like God, it doesn't mean that we are gods. Or we're trying to be like the Most High as Lucifer declared he was going to try to be. But it means that we were created in his image and likeness, Genesis 1, 26 and 27. We are known of God. We went through Psalm 139, and when you look at the intricate detail with which he knows us, he knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows us better than a doctor can possibly know us when he sends us through that MRI machine. And they can look at your whole body in a 3D thing inside and out and know exactly what you, they still don't know you like God knows you. He knows us individually. And we, are, we were made to be caretakers of his creation. We talked about that last time. But I want to look at that in relation to that. There's, there's a huge part that we, we will make it in a statement and just rush on. But when you stop and think about it, it tells us a little bit about, who, a lot about who we are. This aspect of, I was made to relate to his creation. And that's where we begin tonight. That's where this second handout comes in. And I'd like for you to keep that before you if you would. Because there there a lot of things about who we are that has to do with the purpose for which God created, the role that he gave us to fulfill. In fact, I would submit this to you. You will never be content. You will never be happy until you fulfill the role for which God created you. Whatever that role may be. If it's a role to lead, then until you lead, you're not going to be fulfilled. If it's to follow or to serve under, you will not be fulfilled until you do that. But each part of God's creation was made for a purpose. And we're going to look at that a little bit tonight. To relate, of course, is when things have some correlation between each other. Some are, in a sense, personal relationships as, as between man and God. God is a person. And he created man after his image and likeness. So we have personhood. Animals are not people. I get frustrated when I hear, especially believers, refer to their animals as these are our children. No, they're not. They're creatures. They're another species. They cannot be your children. Now, I understand that emotional attachment is trying to do, but I, I think it confuses things. I get just as frustrated hearing them say that as I do about Christians saying that so-and-so who went to heaven, oh, he, be, he got his wings. He's an angel. No, he's not. He is now above the angels. Why would you demote someone, a born-again believer who's gone to heaven? He will judge the angels. He didn't become an angel. It's a different creature, different purpose. Angels can't be saved. He was saved. So as we relate, let's understand what God created us to be, who we are. And then we can understand how we're to function. Now, we're going to come in lesson three to that dark side of things, who we, be, who we were before Christ. 
between who God created us to be in Genesis 1 and 2, what we became in Genesis chapters 3 and following because of sin. And before we came to know Christ, which is lesson number one that we studied, who we are in Christ. So there's that gap, and that's the next lesson. But notice here in the introductory to this second handout I gave you, God, well, God made us to relate to his creation, humans, nature, and to the creator. Some people are born thinking that, you know, I don't need to relate to other people. In fact, Darwin, he, in his studies and his conclusions about the origins of man, that we that were not created, we are not the product of a personal, uh, all-powerful, all-knowing being called God who made man after his own image and likeness. He said, no, no, that's not what happened. We evolved by chance over billions of years and our species, the human species, we just happened to evolve further so we elevated ourselves above the animals. They are just more primitive forms of what we were but they haven't learned to do the things we've learned to do and they haven't mastered it, so they're down here on the food chain, we're up here. Survival of the fittest. And we are, obviously, the fittest. Which is their theory. Well, Freud comes along in all this modern day, remember that Freud is the, the father of modern day psychology and psychiatry, okay? What is his? He is a Darwinist and he believes that we evolved, but Man is basically an animal, but he's an animal that has suppressed his base instinct to isolate himself. See, they say that man wants to be by himself and do his own thing and not relate to anyone. That's the animal instinct. But yet man in his advanced state, he's learned to subdue that base instinct and to learn to behave toward others in a certain way. But when you start reading some of Freud's conclusions, it, it is some of the most debased and perverted things you've ever heard. So how does the United States of America and other modern day countries who are sophisticated and well developed, how do they fall for such nonsense? Well, the minute you take God out and you try to find something to put in its place, it's going to be absurd. Well, that's where we are. And so when you go to modern day psychologists and psychiatrists, they're going to give you counsel to how to live your life based on those principles. I would counsel you, don't go to those people to try to figure out who you are. You want to figure out who you are? Go to the one who made you and the purpose for which he made you. The fall, the second point there, the fall has confused these relationships. Man's rebellion against God denies those. Darwin, man is an evolved animal. There's no image of God in him. There's no distinction between man and other animals except that he advanced further on the evolution chain than the other forms of animals. Freud, he says, man is an evolved animal who has subdued the base instincts to isolate and to behave in community with others. So he, he, he overcame that and he's able to sort of relate, but that's how he explains these shootings and all these other things that go on. The, all those, it's not evil and sin, it's just his basic instincts. We're fighting that. Well, today, man is beginning to reject the most basic elements of human distinction and relationship, male and female. In fact, some are saying those aren't even factors, so they call themselves some kind of neutral term that's neither male nor female. But yet it goes against everything that science can observe, and yet they call it science. So only Genesis gives the adequate design for the relationship of God's creation to itself and to its creator. And I want you to look at something. I'm trying to show you something. I, that's the reason I, I did this handout because the more you look at it and the more you understand it in, rela in relation to who God made us to be, the more we're going to understand what is going on in the world around us and how Satan is literally perverting what God made us to be and flipping it exactly upside down opposite of what he made it to be. So look with me, if you will. First of all, what are the relationships? As we're supposed to relate to God's creation, he made us as relational beings because he is a relational being. 
He wants a relationship with his creation. And we see that in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. Well, let's look at, from man's perspective, what are the relationships that we have? First of all, to other humans. By the way, this is by no means exhaustive. It's just some things I threw together this morning and this afternoon. And I put it down just so we could have something to go by. But there's a lot more to this I'd like to study and bring out. Because it, it, it does a lot for the family, for marriage relationships, for families, for communities, for this nonsense that we're seeing going on today. We say, we don't know how in the world they can come to this. Well, Romans 1 told us how they got here, and we're seeing it happen today before our very eyes. Well, the relationships as God does Remember this is, I put it there as emphasized, prior to the fall. Now, you and I cannot rightfully imagine what it was to live before the fall of man and the the curse of sin. Because that's all we know. But God designed, this design was made before that fall. And it hasn't changed. Ultimately, it will come back to this and God will accomplish what he set out in Genesis 1 and 2 to do. He'll accomplish that in Revelation chapters 21 and 22. Those 1185 or so chapters in between, he's bringing man back to himself. That's what the Bible story is all about. Well, the relationships, as we relate to God's creation, they are, first of all, we see relationships to other humans. Look at Genesis 1, 27 and 28. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Without going back and analyzing it in detail, let me just give you a statement. I was reading in the commentary, and as I thought about it, it's very, it, it seems to fit very appropriately. See, God's order of creation, he began from, if it's on a hierarchy scale, it began at the bottom, and it kept going, 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 until it got to man, which was the highest part of the hierarchy of God as far as his creation. Man was the crown of his creation. That's why he came on day six, not on day one. But as we come to that, He created man, and it says here, it said he made them in his image and likeness, verses 25, 26, and beginning of 27. It says, male and female created he them. Now, we don't find out the details of how he made the woman until over in chapter 2. But so we know that this is his purpose. But look at verse 28. And God blessed them. And he said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb-bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree, in the which there is fruit of a tree-yielding seed, to you it shall be for meat." Now stop and think about this. God made all the creation and then made man and said, all of this is yours. Now look at the different relationships of man in this context. First of all, man is in in relation to other people. We see a marital relationship, don't we? He created Adam, a full-grown adult. He Later we see over in chapter 2, if you look there at uh, verses 20, Uh, It says, And Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the fowl of the air, to every beast of the field. And Adam was not, for Adam was not found in help meet for him. And the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took of his rib, one of his ribs, and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib, which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman, and brought her unto man. And Adam said, the first time Adam is recorded as speaking, It says, And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So we see that this is how man and and woman came to be created. God created them with these distinctions, male and female. This is not societal opinions. This was not an evolutionary, whatever you want to call it. God designed them this way. And he designed them to relate one to another. Number one, there's a marital relationship. It says, be fruitful. They were to relate in such a way that they were fruitful. And, of course, they would have children. 
That's the phrase, and multiply. So here's now a family relationship. So there's a relationship between a man and his wife. That's the most intimate of relationships between, among all the other relationships on earth. It's between a man and his wife. And then the next closest one, you be fruitful and multiply. Now you have children, so not only are you relating one to another, but you are parenting these offspring. God said you be fruitful and multiply. So now we have a family relationship, parental responsibilities, and the relationship of a child to his parents. And then we have community, replenish. And that word replenish means to fill the earth. Now we've, no, we've come nowhere close to filling the earth yet with people. And we're saying the earth is overpopulated. and we're, No, we're not. God's commission was you fill the earth. And had we obeyed the Lord, I think humanity would be in better shape now than they are. But today, and especially in our wisdom here in places like China, where we think it's necessary to abort or to kill off certain parts of the population, to control population growth, it goes in direct contradiction to what God said is his plan. But those are the relationships he designed at the beginning. First of all, one to another, marital. Multiply, that's your children, so you have the parental and family relationship. And then community. Well, community is when you have a lot of different people from different families living in close proximity one to another. And we are to relate one to another. So as opposed to what Darwin and Freud came to the conclusion on, we were not made to isolate ourselves and to attack others. We were made to relate one to another, to have a sense of community. Now, remember, this is before the fall of man. This is before sin entered into the picture. But then man also has a relationship to uh, nature. What is his relate? First of all, we see stewardship. Uh, verses 28, it says, you'll have dominion, subdue it and have dominion over the animals. Subdue means to bring under. And over, if you look over in chapter 2, verse 15, it says, And the Lord God put man and, took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the idea there is he's, he's a steward over it. He keeps it within bounds. He's using and enjoying God's creation, but he is having control over it. Dominion over the animals, that means... He is the master, the animal is subject to him. Now at this point in time, as we looked at last time, they're not eating flesh. Animals aren't eating flesh, and humans are not eating flesh. We're eating, we're vegetarians, okay? That doesn't come till after the flood, hundreds of years later. So he's there to subdue, steward over the earth, dominion over the animals, and then look at his sustenance. There in verses 29 and 30 of Genesis 1, it says, And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb-bearing seed, everything that he had created upon the face of the earth, he gave to them for food. It's for you to enjoy. Enjoy it. Take, take what you want from it. Later, he told them, and there in Genesis chapter End of chapter 8 and chapter 9 says, Now you may begin to eat meat. It is now meat for you. Everything that creeps upon the earth, you can eat it. Now that everything that creepeth, not everything that creepeth, do I really have the appetite to eat. I have seen things, I have seen people eat things that I have no desire to try. I have tried things I had no desire to try, to be honest with you. But that's the relationship to nature. We are not to worship nature. We, are not de we don't depend upon nature directly for our existence or survival. So don't we, de well, let me get there, because this comes to the next relationship, and that's man, man's relationship to his creator. How, how in a world without sin was man to survive? Well, verse 29 says God's given him everything, every herb, tree, fruit, whatever was there, all the vegetation, was there for the purpose of sustaining human life and animal life. Enjoy it. And there are no weeds, there are no pests, there are nothing to hinder things from growing in a perfect state. You imagine those tomatoes. Imagine that corn and other things. I think we'll see that maybe during the millennial kingdom. 
It's going to be close. The closest thing to what it was in the Garden of Eden before we get to the new heavens and new earth is going to be the millennial kingdom. I'm not sure it's going to be exactly the same, but it's going to be pretty close because there the lion lays down with the lamb. Today, the lamb will be inside the lion if they try to lay down together. It's, there's an enmity. That will not be the case anymore during the millennial kingdom. But life sustenance was given to man. So not, notice the phrase there. And God said, behold, I have given you. This is not something you did. This did not evolve by chance. I gave you this. Now it says, you take and you subdue it, and you have dominion over the animals, but understand that your life sustenance, your livelihood depends on me. Was well, that true even after the fall? Yes, it is. Because remember over in Deuteronomy chapters 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11? He, he told them in chapter 7, you be, what was it, you be dependent, and then you be humble. Don't you get out there in chapter 7 toward the end of the chapter, he, chapter 8, I mean. He says, don't you get there and say, look what we did. Look what we have built for ourselves. He said, because it is the Lord that gives you the ability to gain wealth. Don't ever forget who does. And this is the relationship to the creator. We have always been dependent upon him for our sustenance and the environment's sustenance. For plants to grow, it depends upon what? All the other elements of nature, the planets, the light, the darkness, you have the cold, the heat, all the different things that are necessary, he provides. And then the animal life, they, they are sustained, and it keeps that in balance. God is the one who provides for humans. He provides it for nature itself, so we're dependent upon the Lord for that. He also is the one who defines a standard of good and bad. Now well, think about that. Here, here then the verse 31, chapter 1, verse 31, said, And God saw everything which he had made, the first six days, from the beginning, from, you know, separating light, creating light, and then separating the dry land from the other, and putting the vegetation, then putting the planets, and then putting the fowls and the fish, and then the animals and man on day six, finally. He looks at everything and he says, not only did he say it's good, he said it is very good. The evening and the morning were the sixth day. And as we know, he rested on the seventh day. But then look over at chapter 2 and verse 18. It says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help, I will make and help meet for him. I'm going to make someone that is a help and that is adequate for him. The animals were male and female. And imagine as he's naming all the animals that are coming, the Lord's bringing them one by one to him, or couple by couple, I guess, and he's naming them off. And as one man described it, I think it was Dr. Whitcomb, He's saying, you know, here we have Mr. Lion and Mrs. Lion, and we have Mr. Elephant, Mrs. Elephant, and, and then he keeps saying, just man. Just male, no female, no com a companion for him. And I want you to look at this state. This goes back to how we relate to creation. It is not good for a man to be alone. We were not created to be alone, to be independent, to be out there all by ourselves and not relate to anybody. It is not healthy for mankind. In fact, we are not made to be single. He designed it to where to fulfill our purposes. Man needs a help meet. And she, her purpose is to meet that need. And we'll look at that more in a moment. So there's a standard for what is good and bad. Now look at the society today. And again, we're, I'm looking at all this directly in proportion to our study, who we are. Finding our identity in Christ and in the scriptures. Because look at the world around us. How many people, and I've heard this, folks, over and over, and I heard it this week. Was it this week that I got a haircut or last week? Whatever day I got my last haircut, I was there and I was hearing a debate going on between two or three women talking about some circumstance. And, and they were talking, says, one says, I don't need a man. I got to think, I said, you don't? 
Or a man might say, I don't need a woman. Well, you don't. God said it's not good for you to be alone. He made a woman for you. Now, the problem is, is everybody's going out after the wrong woman or the wrong man for the wrong reasons and expecting the right results, and they're not going to find it. You have to go and follow God's plan on that, too. And we'll get to that in a moment under the aspect of obedience. But God, the only part of God's creation that he said is not good is that man should be alone. So he made for him the woman. And I, I always remember what Brother Dusty said along this line. He said, remember when he said, men, when you get to thinking you're something and then you're better than she is, just remember you're nothing but mud and she's prime rib. All the beasts of the, of the earth and, and man were taken from the dust of the earth. But the woman was taken from the rib of man. It was a special, it was, it was, the, the source and the purpose for which she was made was very, very special. Now, and we're going to look at that given what time we have left in just a moment. Uh, on page two, I've got a quote there that I want you to think about and study. There's a lot more. There are pages and pages more that I wish I could have put in there, but space didn't allow our time. But when God does things, he does it right, and he does it for a reason. And when we will accept his purpose for creation, it is a wonderful, fulfilling thing. Well, we were also, the relationship between man and his creator, well, all of creation and its creator, is obedience. Obedience. He is the creator. We are the creation. He has the rights and ownership over us. Now, again, the reason many people today don't know their identity is, number one, we've rejected God. We've rejected him as creator. We're, we've rejected our accountability to him. We reject that we must obey his plan for our lives. And the moment you do that, you've created for yourself a life of misery. I don't care how much fun or parties or riches you may bring you are miserable because you're not fulfilling that for which you were created to fulfill. Obedience. Notice this. In, over in ch chapter 1, verse 20, I'm sorry, 29, it says, Behold, I have given you everything. You can eat anything. But then in chapter 2, and I don't know why I put 324. Maybe it is 324. No, it's not 324. It's 220 until, until 324. I'm sorry, that's the hierarchy. Forgive me. Look over with me at chapter 2. I didn't put this verse in here for some reason. Chapter 2 and verse 17. Well, verse 16 says, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but... Now, some people argue, why did God do this? Why did he put that one tree? But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. You know, everything was going so well. All the creation was there. Why did God create evil? Be careful how we say that. In him is no darkness. In him is no evil. In him is no death. He is life. He is good. He is righteousness. So, so you mean the tree of knowledge of good and evil was not a bad thing? No, it wasn't. It was part of God's perfect creation that he said, behold, it was very good. So what, what happened? The problem was not the tree. The problem was the disobedience of man. He said, of every tree you can freely eat, but of this one tree, don't eat of it. Because the day you do, you will surely die. You see, obedience requires that option to disobey, doesn't it? It was not that God created all this evil or bad. No, it's that man did not obey God. And man was created to obey the creator. You can eat everything, but don't eat this one thing. And what did Satan do? He comes and he says, did God say you can't eat of anything? Oh, no, no, he didn't say that. Oh, we can eat of everything, but of this one tree we can't eat. Oh, really? Notice how he focused her attention on that one tree out of all the trees. Well, you're not going to die. He knows the day you eat thereof, you're going to be like him. Your eyes will be open. You'll know good and evil. You'll be as gods. And then she got to looking at it and listening to him. And she ate. She gave it to her husband. He ate. 
and plunged all of humanity into sin. They did not do for that for which they were created. And that means that to honor, ultimately, our obedience to the Lord and all of creation fulfilling its purpose glorifies the Creator. That's why Psalm says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament declares His handiwork. That's what we were made for. So our relationship, to it's life sustenance. Our, the Creator gives us life. He said, all these things, you're going to do this, this, and this, but I'm going to give you what is going to keep you alive. Today, God gives us the very breath we breathe. I don't think, I don't believe we're going to, we're going to live a day longer than the days he's already numbered. He gives us that breath. He gives us that life, and he gives us the sustenance for it. He, he sustains us. I don't think we're going to save this planet. We should be good stewards, but God is going to destroy this planet. He's already told us how he's going to do it. We just don't know the date he's going to do it. But it's going to be within the next seven, well, possibly within the next seven years. The tribulation, you talk about global warming, it's going to be devastating. But until then, we are stewards of it, and he is going to sustain us through it. But then we have a hierarchy. Now, hierarchy means there's authority. There is one thing that other things depend on or they fall as submissive to. Now, I want you to look at these four general areas of authority. One is God, as creator. He is the ultimate authority. He creates, he owns, he has the rights to, period. Everything else below, man, woman, nature, they answer to him. All right, so man is under God, but he placed man over all of his creation. So he has to, have to, to subdue the earth and to have dominion over the animals. Out of man, he took woman, and she was to be the help meet for him. Just in that title, her purpose is to help him accomplish his God-given purpose. That is her God-given purpose. Together, they work as one. He com she completes him, and he completes her in her purpose. And you'll see that as we study this a little more, but let me go a step further before I do that. And then there's nature, all of nature, whether it be the earth, the plantation, the seas, the animals, all of them, they are in that, in that place where they are under the dominion of man. That's God's level of hierarchy. Now think about this for a moment. In the fall, in chapter 3, what's going to happen? Here, up until the fall, we have... God telling man who also leads his wife, and they together rule over the creation God gave them. What happened in the fall? Who starts the ball rolling in the fall, the sin? Satan. So all of a sudden, instead of God telling, dictating, these things are flipped upside down. Satan tells the woman, and what does she do? She eats the fruit. But then what happens next? She gives it to the husband, tells him to eat it. And he eats. And one of two things, they're all telling God, we're not doing what you said, or they're not listening to God. So the very hierarchy that God established is flipped upside down. Nature is telling, and what is going on today? We, are, we have people in the United States of America who are starving. We have people in the United States of America who are homeless. We have soldiers that are homeless. Now, granted, many of these, it's by poor choices they made and sin in their lives. But the truth is, we have people that that's not the case. But let me ask you, just in the past two or three weeks, what is the priority of the leadership of our nation? We passed this massive funding. For what? The Green New Deal. Let's save this planet. Okay, we got people starving, but we got to save this planet. Nature is driving the thing. And then it comes down to the next thing is what? They're pushing and pressing on these things of the gender equalities. and they, So in other words, they start throwing race in there and gender in there or these gender neutral, all that's becoming. And the last thing is the order that God established. Men are not leading the way men ought to be leading. Their homes... And then, of course, God is taken out completely. In fact, some places, as in some school districts that I heard about this past week, 
They have removed the Bible from the school libraries. Do you understand what I'm saying about this, this thing of who we are? The world is trying to figure it out, and they don't know why. Because they will not go back to the scriptures. Now, I, I want to point out two things. Let me read this paragraph at the top of the back of the page. And this is, comes out of a commentary, the New American uh, Commentary. And the author wrote this, as this role relationship of leader and followers is indicated directly and implicitly. First, the participant structure of Genesis 2 to 3 shows implicitly the hierarchy of creation. God, the man, woman, animal, or serpent. But this was reversed in the fall, and the woman listens to the serpent, and the man listens to the woman, and no one listens to God. The usurpation of the creation ideal is, however, properly rearranged in the judgment oracles. Now the serpent is subject to the seed of the woman, and the woman is subject to the man, and all subject once again under the Lord. That's a, that's a powerful statement. God will ultimately bring that back around. No matter who tries to deny him that, ultimately they will bend their knee and they will confess with their tongues that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Period. Now whether we do it in this life in repentance and receiving Christ, or whether we do it in judgment, in remorse and condemnation, make no mistake, every person will do that. That's according to uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 11, I believe it is. 10 and 11. But then I want to take just a few moments. One of the biggest critiques of Genesis, and you know, in this modern day, in, they have what they call feminist theology and feminist theologians. And what they do is, that while they might try to interpret much of the scripture, they say this old patriarch, patriarchal, chauvinistic Genesis says we need to do something about that. We have to somehow get away from that, thinking that, well, these were male chauvinist writers and they were reflecting that. This is not God's word. It's not God's design. He made them all equal. Well, let me read something to you. And this is from a Christian's perspective. I had not thought of this in this way. I know that this is God's word. I know that that order is proper. And if we will fulfill that order, we will fulfill God's purpose for our lives. But this author, the same commentary, he wrote this. I want you to read along, and I want you to think about this. Not only for one purpose, that is, why God made us the way he did. And how that will ultimately fulfill our joy and our happiness. But also, how the world is getting it so wrong. Because they are rebelling against his design, which was to make them happy. And they think they will find happiness by throwing it the other way. Look at this aspect of it's talking, speaking about the verses he will make a help meet for him. The word there, help meet, is one word, a help adequate, designed for man. And here he said this, she is called Adam's helper, Ezer in the Hebrew, which defines the role that the woman will play. In what way would Eve become a helper to, to the man? The term, the term means help in the sense of aid, support, and is used of the Lord's aiding his people in, to face the enemies. Psalm 20, verse 2 and 3, 121, 1 through 2, and so forth. Moses spoke of God as his helper who delivered him from Pharaoh, Exodus 18, 4. And it is often associated with shield in describing God's protective care of his people. There is no sense derived from the word linguistically or from the context of the garden narrative that the woman is a lesser person because of her role, her role differs. In the case of the biblical model, the helper is an indispensable partner required to achieve the divine commission. Helper, as we have seen it from its Old Testament usage, means a woman will play an integral part, in this case, in human survival and success. What the man lacks, the woman accomplishes. As Paul said concisely, the, woman, the man was not made for the woman, but the woman for the man. The woman makes it possible for the man to achieve the blessing that he otherwise could not do alone. And obviously, the woman cannot achieve it apart from the man. 
Do you see how God made man and woman dependent upon each other to accomplish what he put them here to do, which would then glorify him? One's not greater than the other. One's not more important than the other. They're both absolutely essential. Without her, he can't do his part. Without him, she can't do her part. And no matter how much they try to do it, modern science has not been able to change this. Men want to become women. Women want to become men. And all the mess in between. The best they can do is try to take what God has done and somehow glue it over here and see if it'll work. And it doesn't. God knew what he did. And who we are comes by recognizing who God made us to be and fulfilling that purpose. And that, that goes back, of course, we're still talking here in these passages before the fall. And we're going to get into what happens after the fall in just a little bit. Turn, going back to your study number two sheet, just as one more point, we're just going to touch on it and we'll be done there. But this is sufficient. It doesn't require a lot, although we could preach more than one message on it. I am made for thankful, obedient worship to God. You see, we're made for thankful. What, what, do, what do we mean by thankful, obedient worship? Well, when God gives us everything, and then in verses 29, 30, he says, Now, I'm going to give you this that you can live. It's going to be meat for you. You, you have to eat. And I'm going to give you all this to supply. And our devotion, we don't thank Mother Earth. There's no such thing as Mother Earth. There's no Father Earth. There's God, our Creator. He is God, our Sustainer. He is our Provider. He is our Helper. Which is a privileged term, by the way. So we are to be thankful. Now, if we just, and I just want to close with this. If we go to Romans chapter 1. What happens when we reject God? Romans chapter 1, verses 18 and following. Verse 19 says, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. It talks about it being in creation, verse 20. Because, verse 21, Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, and what? Neither were thankful. Not only did they choose to reject God and reject this creation and the order and all this, they didn't even appreciate the fact that he gives them air to breathe and he, they breathe in oxygen and breathe out what? Carbon dioxide, which will kill you. So we take life-giving oxygen and we breathe out something that will kill you. And God takes that and through plants and everything else, he turns it back into life-giving what? Oxygen. So the breath we breathe is given by him. And he grows the food that we eat. And he provides, and, he, and the very breath and efforts they have to prove he doesn't exist, all the while he is providing for them to survive, to have an opportunity to repent and to confess him as Lord. But here's the thing. He says, they, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise. They became fools. And look at this. They changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man, into birds, and four-footed bees, and creeping things. God didn't make us. We evolved. And there's not one God. There are many gods and. Cats can be gods, and dogs can be gods, and serpents can be gods. Just go, through, go throughout Egypt. And these other pagan nations and all the things, they worship the sun, they worship the moon, they worship, and you name it. In the United States of America, we worship self. We worship trees. That's what happens when we don't understand who we are, who God is, and who he made us to be. Well, next time, we're going to get into that darker period in the life of a believer anyway to an unbeliever we're going to get into the dark state in which he now lives but it's important that we understand after who God made us to be and before we became who we are now in Christ there's that period of who we were before Christ before he transformed our lives 
And that is the state of every living human being today that doesn't know Jesus as Savior. I don't care how religious, I don't care how good, I don't care how lovely they are. That is their condition. So let's, we'll look at that next time. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for these truths that, Lord, they are profound. And time does not permit us in one setting to go throughout all that we could. But Lord, help us to just understand in the grand scheme of things, you made us and we're accountable to you. And you made us in an order and with a purpose. And Lord, wherever you place us in creation, help us to glorify you by fulfilling not our design, not society or culture's design, but Lord, your design for our individual lives, wherever you've placed us. And Lord, may we be thankful, and may we glorify you and point others to you as we do. Apply your word to our hearts, and Lord, we pray for our nation, for our leaders. Lord, we pray that you would turn this nation's heart back to you, and they would get their eyes off of the corruptible things and put them back on the uncorruptible God that made them. Apply your word now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.